Hey everyone, welcome to Just Mental Health with Steph and M, the podcast where we discuss mental health issues from a social justice lens. I'm Emily. And I'm Stephanie. A quick disclaimer before we get started. We are mental health professionals, but this is not to be taken as professional advice. We are also aware that our privilege may cloud our perspective on some topics, and we not only welcome, but encourage you to message us with criticism and correction. Let's get started. So we have started to have a business of the week, um, paying uh, close attention to um, women and minority owned business businesses. Uh, so our first business that we wanna highlight this week um, some a fellow therapist of ours, um, fellow Chicago therapists of, of mine, um, they are called Pivot, and they are located in the Ravenswood neighborhood of Chicago. They specialize in trauma and other life adversities, learning how to pivot after trauma and other life adversities. That's a really clever slogan. Mm -hmm. Um, so they do individual and group therapy. Individual is either virtual or in person, and group therapy is all virtual. They are trained in a lot of different evidence-based models, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, EMDR, cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure. And they have a website, pivotpsychchicago.org. So if you are looking for Looks like soon they'll also be doing supervision and consultation, training, and speaking. So if you're looking for any of those services, please reach out to them. And now let's go ahead and get started on our topic for today. Stephanie, you want to take it away? Yeah. Um, so today the topic is going to, we're going to talk about two different um, like psychological mental health, um, what would you call terms, um, mm -hmm. and how they could have origins in um, like sexism and misogyny. So the first one that we're gonna talk about is Stockholm Syndrome, which um, I'm really excited about because, okay, so how this happened was, <laughs> I saw a Facebook post, um, and I don't believe everything that I read on Facebook, but I was reading it, and I was like, wait, I never knew this. I had no idea that this was a thing. Pretty much mm -hmm. what the post said was that Stockholm Syndrome is rooted in misogyny and was sort of made up without re any real evidence to discredit um like female survivors of um like abuse or trauma really i thought it was a real thing no no um well i thought it was too until yeah. i had this post and i was like okay i have to see i have to look into this i have to you know check this out and if you google Stockholm syndrome or Stockholm syndrome debunked or Stockholm syndrome myth, which is what I did to find this stuff. There's not a lot out there about how this actually came about. Um, mm. There's a lot out there from like sources that I would consider pretty credible, like Psychology Today and um, like some scientific journals about sort of the accuracy of um, the term Stockholm Syndrome and or also known as trauma bonding, which is what a lot of mm. people are calling it now. Um, it's sort of one of those like pop psychology, armchair psychology terms that can get really popular um, every so often. Everybody uses them for everything. But when you actually look into it, it's not rooted in any real science or in anything evidence-based. So I'm just going to read a little bit about um, the myth of Stockholm Syndrome. Does, um, oh, oh, you have ahead. to redefine Stockholm We should probably define it in case anyone doesn't actually know what it is. Oh, yeah, 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 I was going to. So, um, okay. So Stockholm Syndrome is where survivors of kidnapping 
um, kind of align with and sympathize with their captors. That's where it started. And like in Beauty of the Beauty and the Beast. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> often brought up for that. Yeah. Um, and the thing that's weird about it is that it's, at least according to the Stockholm Syndrome sort of theory, is that these survivors um, will actually protect or defend their captors. Um, they align with them, they feel close to them, they may even fall in love with them, and they don't take opportunity to get out or escape, um, mm -hmm. even when that's there. So, um, yeah, this is really big in popular culture. There's lots of movies about it. There's songs, so many songs about Stockholm Syndrome, like that's the name of them. Um, and so how it actually, this is the story of where it came from. And then I'll tell you sort of like the, the real story, as mm -hmm. they're saying. Um, so it happened in, and I'm going to butcher this word probably, um, Normal Storg, Sweden, mm -hmm. um, was, it was, there was a bank robbery and a hostage situation. Um, and it was in 1973. Um, Jan Eric Olson was a convicted criminal who had disappeared while on furlough from prison and then held up a bank and took four hostages. During the ensuing negotiations, Swedish Minister of Justice, Lennart Geir, I don't know how to say his name, allowed Olson's former cellmate and friend Clark to be brought from prison to the bank. Um, so famously, the hostages then bonded with their captors and acted to protect them despite their repeated threats to kill them all. Police finally mounted a tear gas attack five days into the crisis and the robbers surrendered. Um, so that's where that term came from, was that the sort of strange phenomenon of these captors or these captees aligning with their captors. Um, and everyone was like, why would they do that? That doesn't make any sense. That's weird. It's got to be this new syndrome that mm -hmm. this guy came up with. So it, um, what really happened, <laughs> and I'll just read you this a little bit and then we'll get mm -hmm. into talking about it. But Stockholm syndrome was invented in 1973 after a hostage taking at the bank. One of the hostages, Kristen in Mark, criticized police, police and government responses as dangerous and disorganized and aligned tactically with the hostage takers. After the hostage taking, Kristen became the first person said to have Stockholm Syndrome, a new label invented just for the occasion. Since then, Stockholm Syndrome has become a received truth, a concept that both reflects and upholds the habits of finding pathologies in the minds of victims of violence, particularly women. Oddly, the psychiatrist who coined the term Stockholm Syndrome never spoke with Kristen and Mark. Neither have present-day experts who present misinformation and perpetuate the myth. So the police psychologist came up with this, literally from this one event, never interviewed um, the woman who it, it came from. And there's no like evidence for this. It's really a theory. Mm -hmm. um, so when, um, from her point of view, like when you hear her talking about it later as she, she you know, after everything was sort of over, um, she talked about it and her thing was mostly that she disagreed with how the police were handling the situation. She felt that they were making things worse and putting more people in danger. Um, mm -hmm. 
from what they were. So she was really critical of the government and the police. And, but it's not like she was defending the, yeah. she was. Well, that's where it gets a little weird. So like, I guess there was supposedly a romantic relationship between her and the guy that took them captive. Um, but I don't, I don't really know about that part as much because mostly for me, the thing that I think is interesting is just that somebody, someone who's supposed to be like a scientific person, you know, would just come up with this theory without interviewing the person. Mm -hmm. And then it just sort of like takes off and it's just kind of slapped on as a label for kidnapping victims, women in abusive um, relationships. Um, so stuff like that. And the problem is it's just not as clear cut as that. Um, mm -hmm. Stockholm syndrome is very, very rare, even just according to the people that, you know, d they don't diagnose it, but um, according to the FBI, you know, when they keep track of this stuff, mm -hmm. anyone having Stockholm syndrome from a situation, it's very, very rare. And it's almost always, always applied to women. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, like people that, so like children that were kidnapped at a young age and then um, years later, you know, they were found or whatever, um, they'll sort of apply it to that. Like they bonded with their captors. Um, like Elizabeth Smart, you remember that case? Mm -hmm. she's one that um, some, you know, people have come out and said that she had Stockholm syndrome because she didn't try to run away at every opportunity that was given to her. Um, but when you hear her talk about it, she says that it was not Stockholm syndrome. It was not because she aligned with them or felt sorry for them. It was because she was terrified. Yeah. So, That's what I've been thinking as we, as I'm listening mm -hmm. to you, that I think the Stockholm syndrome is like a syndrome, like something that you like get, <laughs> that you would get like <laughs> diagnosed with or whatever. That's not a real thing. It's more or so a trauma response. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, like you, so there's, I mean, there's like, People know about fight, but there's also fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Mm -hmm. And going along with what your captor perpetrator is doing or asking you to do is fawning, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like feeling like you've lost all control and going along with what they're doing in order to protect yourself. Because if you retaliate, it can make things worse. Like that's the concept and that's what happens. And that's yes. the response. It's not Stockholm syndrome. Right. That's, so that's what the argument is, is that mm -hmm. what is being labeled as Stockholm syndrome is just not an accurate picture of, of what's happening, that it is more of a survival technique. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, if you're trying to reduce the amount of harm that is inflicted upon you, or you're trying to stay alive in a situation and you're fawning, like you said, or you're making decisions of like, I'm going to be nice to this person. I'm going to be um, understanding and sympathetic, whatever. I'm going to comply. It's because you're trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to people that have been through that or women that have survived domestic violence situations, that's a lot of what they say is I was trying to survive. Right. The other part of it is that it doesn't take into account if you're just saying, oh, it's Stockholm syndrome, especially when it when it we're talking about like domestic violence situations. You know, well, why doesn't she leave? Mm -hmm. Um well, Stockholm syndrome doesn't take into account the manipulation and the gaslighting and the sort of brainwashing that can happen in mm -hmm intimate partner violence um 
or for children that are being abused by their caretaker or their parent um like what other choice do they have but to align with their right you know caregiver so and it, with children sorry to cut you no off. you go ahead um with children it's even different because they don't know any better you know i mean not to say like that sounded blaming of 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 adults but that's not how i meant it i'm you know like children are ch children don't even children just have less knowledge about people and what relate what relationships are appropriate and inappropriate anyway and it is common for kids who are abused to have um, positive feelings toward their abuser because they don't know that it's abuse, mm -hmm. you know, and they've been groomed and their their abuser is is giving them all of these, you know, telling them all of these seemingly positive things that a child doesn't know to to not see it for what it for for what they're saying, right. Yeah. Right. And that's a, that goes back to the like, like you said, grooming, but also like brainwashing and gaslighting and just all of the manipulation tactics that come with a, the abusive, toxic relationship cycle. Um, mm -hmm. And I, we don't have like a whole lot of time to go into that. But I mean, you know, the the cycle that's typically talked about is sort of that honeymoon phase mm -hmm. in the beginning or the where there's like love bombing um where they're showering you with gifts or attention and affection and praise and they're just you know like the knight in shining armor sort of this perfect um person this perfect partner mm -hmm. and then Sort of once they get you hooked you know they get you to fall in love with them uh, right. pretty much then the manipulation um starts and the falling in love came first yes that's what's different about stockholm syndrome you know like they fall in love and then they abuse you versus stockholm syndrome they abuse you or kidnap you and then um, exactly yeah e exactly so that's why you can't you know, Stockholm Syndrome can't be applied in those situations because Stockholm Syndrome is with, you know, it has to happen with um, strangers, people you didn't know before that are taking you captive. I mean, that's, you know, how it was outlined in the mm -hmm. beginning. Um, and, but even then, you know, it, it's aligning with your captor, they're a complete stranger, um, sort of not helping or not trying to escape or leave or get free or whatever, not fighting back, all of those things like, and then the sort of defending um, the captor are all the defining characteristics of Stockholm mm -hmm. syndrome. Um, but again, it's sort of this blanket term mm -hmm. to put on of like, we don't understand why this person would do this. Um, so it's got to be this weird psychological phenomenon. And really, though, when you are looking in, like, as far as trauma goes, it makes sense. Like you said, mm -hmm. that in that moment, they're just trying to survive. So what critics of Stockholm Syndrome are saying um, is that it was a myth invented to discredit women victims of violence. Mm -hmm. It not only discredits them, it obscures their... Um, their resistance to violence. So it says that, you know, women or victims are not resisting. They're just like freely going along with that, which is not accurate either, because even if someone isn't physically resisting, it doesn't mean that they're not like mentally or emotionally resisting in some way. Mm -hmm. You know, kids may not be able to go against their parents or uh, a, a female victim may not be able to go against like a male perpetrator just because of like anatomy, maybe he's stronger or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not internally resisting. Um, so mm -hmm. it's 
it's misogynistic in that way. And then it also, yeah. it shifts the focus away from the actual events that happen to the pathologies in the minds of the victim. So it's victim blaming. Mm -hmm. It's not saying, okay, this person took you captive and you were yeah. terrified and afraid. It's saying you developed a abnormal relationship with them. And that's yeah. weird, you know? And then, um, that's what I was going to say is it's like it whenever I think of like when I hear the term Stockholm syndrome I think like helpless woman that's mm -hmm. the image that, like pops mm -hmm. into my mind and and yeah, yeah I mean it's it certainly makes sense the way that you're describing it as misogynistic because that's clearly not what happens yeah because every sort of case that they have said this could be a case of Stockholm syndrome mm -hmm. in the media it's been a female victim um and in the movies in you know the media it's always a female victim so it is really just uh like oh i can't think of words today this is bad it's like um just really gendered um uh -huh. which it it doesn't really make sense that it would need to be um and so it Stockholm syndrome has kind of led into other sort of ideas, like I said before, like trauma bonding or learned helplessness mm -hmm. or what, uh, what they used to say, battered when women's syndrome, um, internalized oppression, stuff like that, which really is just all of it is victim blaming. And yeah. um, instead of just looking at it as, someone trying to survive and as being a very clever way of surviving when you think about it mm -hmm. um that it's it's sort of blaming them like you should have done this why didn't you do this why didn't you escape why didn't you resist yeah you know and it, it just it just that sort of thinking goes all the way back to why did you walk home alone uh-huh you know why did you walk to your car alone why were you wearing that skirt why why did you have so many drinks like it just it sounds like the concept like the concept of like okay <laughs> sorry so the stockholm it's like the connotation that's associated with it i feel mm -hmm. like like it just has this like oh she has stockholm you know like it has this mm -hmm. kind of um but when you do look at it as a trauma response and you, and, and even a post trauma response, you know, because sometimes mm -hmm. you will hear victims sort of like, I wouldn't call it defending, but saying things like, no, that couldn't have been what happened because, um, I don't think, I don't think he knew what he was doing. I don't think he realized it was wrong or I shouldn't have been doing this. I shouldn't have been doing that. And the, they do like, the reason that victims respond that way shortly after their trauma is because their brain is not ready to process what right. happened. You know, that becomes this, a defense mechanism. Right. They're in this, this state of denial because who wants to accept that something like that happened to them? Who wants to accept that someone had that power over them to harm them in this way? But again, that's a trauma response. And then after they have processed it and they you know maybe have been in therapy for a while they realize okay no like this was not my fault this was 100 percent their fault but i think it stems from just a really we just we just do not understand trauma responses like we assume that everyone is able to think rationally <laughs> before during and after their trauma <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it just is so it doesn't make any sense because did, did you think rationally when like di okay did i think rationally like last week before we recorded when i ate the entire pint of ice cream we were on the <laughs> phone and i ate the entire pint of ice cream was i thinking rationally no was i thinking about all the sugar i was consuming no i was thinking this is right in front of me it tastes really good so i'm eating it that's all i was thinking <laughs> you know yeah, and then yeah later you rationally think about it and you're like hmm, maybe that wasn't the best choice for my health right you know and like right so and that's finally, a small example and that's a small of, example like right so imagine being in a life or death situation right I mean, and why do never, we never oh go ahead sorry <laughs> why do we 
why do we accept that that's a that not uh-huh. thinking rationally is is acceptable in those situations but then when it is a life or death situation like you're saying all of that goes that suddenly goes out the window it, it doesn't make any sense right because so like just on more of a practical mm-hmm. you know place like working with trauma survivors and people with ptsd um you know and trying to explain to them how in the moment in a life or death situation you have got to make choices very very fast and your brain does it for you and your body does it for you automatically that is a a thing that was evolved that is a survival skill it is adaptive like your reptilian brain makes these decisions it's like you're spinning the wheel and you can no control over what it lands on Mm -hmm. fight flight fawn or freeze but later when you're able to be rational and process that's just hindsight right you're able to look back and be like well why didn't i do that well i should have done that i should have Mm -hmm. seen that coming blah 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 but that's just because you know now what you didn't know in the moment if you've never had a gun held to your head you know or if you've never been chased by a bear or if you've never had the thought is this person going to kill me then how can you know how you're going to react in a situation you don't and i think if you don't understand it you're lucky because you've never been in a life or death situation Mm -hmm. so you know who are we to say what someone should or shouldn't have done you know in a situation like that even just like driving a car right like so i'm i'm driving and there's a lot of deer where i live and they'll just run out in front of the road because i don't know deer do that it's annoying and you don't see them until they're right there in front of your car and then you've got to make a decision do i hit the deer do i stop do i run off the road like if i'm going too fast and i can't you're making all these decisions really quickly and it's not even a decision really it's whatever your body does yeah i mean it's a (laughs) reflex you're right yeah Yeah. but like something's making those decisions yeah yeah. not aware of it and most of the time i end up like slowing down and swerving to try to miss them but like if there was a car in the lane next to me or a car behind me they would crash into me Mm-hmm. and then and then i would be like oh why did i do that why did i not just hit the deer you know but then if i hit the deer then later i'd be like why did i hit the deer i didn't have to kill it like i didn't have to so there's almost like no win right. in, in a situation like that it's just you just are trying to survive um so you know the other thing one last thing about stockholm Mm -hmm. syndrome and then we'll wrap up about it Um, and i really suggest that like if anyone's interested in this then they should do more research on it and i'll give you a couple of books that you can um you can look into because there's not a lot of studies out there that really give any sort of conclusive evidence one because stockholm syndrome is not a diagnosis it's not in the dsm mm-hmm. i don't think it's ever been oh um, wait so do you can't... want to say what the dsm is? oh yeah the diagnostic <laughs> statistics manual it's a book of um it's a manual that has like all the criteria to be diagnosed with uh, a mental yeah. disorder it's it's often called like you know the therapist bible like if it's not mm-hmm. in the dsm it doesn't exist which is not mm-hmm. true that's another topic but because it's not in the dsm it, you can't be diagnosed with it there's no real clear cut outline of what Stockholm syndrome is or what it takes to be, to have that other than just identifying with your captor and Mm -hmm. not trying to, you know, outwardly resist or escape. Um, Those are really the only things. And it's also really hard to replicate something like that in order to study it. They've tried to study it. But, you know, the participants know that it's not a life or death situation. They know they're mm-hmm. in a study. So yeah. If you were really to put people in a life or death situation like that to study, it would be unethical. So you can't, you, you have to study these things after they happen 
Um, there's no real controlled environment for that. Um, it's so interesting the way one, like it sounds like this one situation in 1973 mm -hmm. just started this whole thing mm -hmm. that now is accepted as fact. Yes. And there's that's the no thing. Evidence for it. Yeah. That's the thing. It's accepted as, as a fact because it's become pop psychology. It's become a term. Pop psychology. Yeah. Yeah. That's gotten used a lot. And when you look at it, you're like, there's just hardly any evidence to suggest at all that this is a thing. And so why are we even running with this? It's not really trauma informed. It's not informed with anything. Um, so if you are interested in learning any more about Stockholm Syndrome, um, there's uh, a couple, there's two books or um, that you could probably read. So The Myth of Stockholm Syndrome and Other Concepts Invented to Discredit Women Victims of Violence. And that's by Dr. Alan Wade. And then um, the other one that is really good is See What You Made Me Do, Power, Control, and Domestic Violence by Jess Hill. And they both talk about exactly what we just talked about, how Stockholm Syndrome is misogynistic and is used to discredit women. Um, mm -hmm. So you can look those up if you want to learn more. Also, just in addition, something that might be interesting. So like, what's the opposite of Stockholm Syndrome? Do you know? Are you quizzing me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the opposite of Stockholm syndrome? You don't know because no, nobody knows. Know. Yeah. Because <laughs> like you never use it. But um, there's Stockholm syndrome, which is like identifying with your captor. Then there's uh -huh. London syndrome, which is like the complete opposite because apparently there was another bank robbery hostage situation in London at another time where all of the captives fought back constantly against mm -hmm. their captor. So it was like the opposite of those situations. And so that's been coined as London syndrome. And of course the one that took off and spread was was the one where, where the yeah. one is, is helpless and the one that was meant to discredit her. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because I've never heard of that. I've never heard of London syndrome. Yeah. Or often called, um, there's also Lyma syndrome, which is like the same thing. Um, another thing that had happened in uh, Lima, Peru. So, I mean, you know, it, there's, you look at these pockets of, of interesting things that have happened and you want to understand the psychology behind them. Um, but if you're looking at it with the lens of you know, misogyny or racism well, the one that or happened anything like that. The huh? Lima syndrome. Lima syndrome was the sim similar to what happened in London. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Okay. There's different names. Like Stockholm syndrome is sometimes also referred to as Helsinki syndrome, which like that's just it's the same thing. But Stockholm mm -hmm. syndrome got popular. You know, it's <laughs> just pick any city that this happened. Whatever. In. Just whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, you could we make, make a syndrome for eating a pint of ice cream. Like you Chicago could syndrome. Like <laughs> you could make a syndrome for anything. Yeah, like clearly it doesn't have to be based I mean, on anything. But yeah, so um, just thought that was interesting. That was really interesting. Encourage people to do more research and to just look into these popular um, terms in psychology. And you know, before you go around and just use them which therapists and mental health professionals are guilty of this too like we need to educate ourselves on what where these come from and what they mean and if they're based in any sort of evidence or reality mm -hmm. no. all right so what do you what did you have did you well have? stephanie so <laughs> i want to talk a bit about borderline personality disorder so this one mm -hmm. is different than Stockholm syndrome because it is in the DSM but like you said the DSM is not the end-all be-all of mental health disorders it has its own fair share of misogyny yeah um so I was doing some reading um so the whole like uh discrediting women like calling women crazy calling calling women hysterical so Hippocrates I want to go back a very long time 
he he was a, like the first that used the term hysteria, mm-hmm. which he said was for women who who like didn't have enough sex, <laughs> and that the way to fix that would be have more sex with your husband. So just <laughs> another way of like controlling women's sexuality, you know, discrediting women's uh, emotions. Um, and so that's, you know, that idea obviously has, um, you know, progressed slightly, but uh, now we've landed on borderline personality disorder. So I read this, it's a blog post um, by Quinn Capes Ivy, Borderline Personality Disorder, A Feminist Critique. It's on this um, page called The F Word, Contemporary UK Feminism. So I wanted to make sure I was giving mm-hmm. her credit for this. So this, this is actually from 2010, and the DSM-5 came out in... 2013 so Mm -hmm. she is going by uh an older yeah an older definition but i don't think it's changed drastically so she has been um well it's not in the uk as emotionally unstable personality disorder but Mm. uh because they use (laughs) they use something what is they use some a different book in europe um they don't probably but um it's the same thing um and she's writing about how she believes that for herself it is accurate, but after reading about it, learning about it, you know, experiencing herself, she sees that it really does have a lot of misogynistic pieces to it. That um, three fourths of people of people who are diagnosed with borderline are women, and why that is. And so she talks about how the criteria are all things that are expected of men and not shamed in men but for women they're called hysterical they're called crazy they're called overly emotional so um what are the criteria huh i said what are the criteria yeah so i'll read through them so chronic feelings of emptiness okay well so five or more of the following chronic feelings of emptiness emotional instability in reaction to -to day-to-day events such as intense episodic sadness, irritability, or anxiety, usually lasting a few hours and only rarely more than a few days. Frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. Identity disturbance with markedly or persistently unstable self-image or sense of self. Impulsive behavior in at least two areas that are potentially self-damaging, such as spending, sex, sexual, sex, substance abuse, reckless driving, binge eating, inappropriate intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, such as frequent displays of temper, constant anger, recurrent physical fights, pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships characterized by extremes between idealization and devaluation, also known as as splitting, recurrent suicidal behavior, gestures or threats or self-harming behavior, transient, stress-related, paranoid ideation, or severe dissociative symptoms. So I guess we didn't really define it, but overall, I mean, that defined it pretty much, but overall, it's like a very deep, intense fear of abandonment. And And then behaviors sort of stemming from that, yeah. Right. Um, Um, Well, one thing I was going to ask, so, because I don't remember, does it say how long it has to be present for in order to be diagnosed? Um, just wondering. Or if there's like an age. I don't um, have the actual, I just have a site that lists, I don't have the actual DSM. Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't remember. Well, I, I only bring that up because you, when you like, don't, don't self-diagnose yourself, people. Because like, when, <laughs> I read stuff like that, you know, on any given day, I probably fit that criteria. Right. But but it's not just like, oh, I sometimes do that. Or I have days where I'm, you know, I have these sort of behaviors Mm -hmm. and symptoms. It's a lot more than that. It's got to be like persistent. Yeah. It's usually got to be like, you have to be like before or after, you know, a certain age. It has to be present for a certain period of time. And 
it has to be, you know, a consistent thing. And if it's a personality mm -hmm. disorder, like borderline personality disorder is, it has to be present for most of this person's life in every aspect without, uh, usually it says like the caveat is like not, uh, while, while they're under, you know, substance use or something. Um, mm -hmm. so like you, it can't be only present when you drink, right. that would be different. Um, or it can't be caused by like medication or, or some other, uh, medical thing. It has to just be like on its own. So mm -hmm. yeah, just, thank you for saying that. Cause that's a good point that a lot of times you say like a deep sense of abandonment and then people are like, Oh my God, I have a fear. Of yeah. Right. Like, like that's not, yeah. <laughs> like not that that's not valid and you know, that's yeah. something to, that people struggle with, but, but it's, yeah, it's to the point where it's like impeding on your life and it yeah. is such a like a core and all your relationships yeah and um, not just because like you're having a bad day or you're feeling insecure for some reason or whatever because like i said i on any given day i probably hit some of those like mm -hmm. you know a lot of that can be relatable to some people but there's a book I haven't read, I haven't read the book, but I think the title, <laughs> ex explained, I think the title explains it well. It's called, I hate you, don't leave me. Yes. Yeah. Have you read it? Yeah. I have it on my bookshelf. Oh yeah. I, I always uh, recommend and mention books that I haven't actually read, but, <laughs> but like other um, people have read and told you. Yeah, I, yeah. And I think that just that title explains it well. I uh -huh. like, I hate you. Like that is the, um, sabotaging relationships piece but don't leave me. That's the fear of abandonment piece. So it's like you have such an intense, deep fear of abandonment that you sabotage your relationship in an effort to not get hurt. But mm -hmm. then that causes you, leads to you feeling right. abandoned so that you're like, don't leave me. It's a confirmation. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So an overview of borderline, but a lot of these, so for example, impulsive behavior in at least two areas, potentially self-damaging, spending sex, substance abuse, reckless driving, good cheating. So mm -hmm. impulsive behavior is much more socially acceptable in men. Mm -hmm. You know, men have a lot of sex versus a woman having a lot of sex. Not, and this isn't even saying a lot of sex. This is saying reckless. So like a lot of unsafe sex. Right, right. It's not just somebody that has a lot of sex. It's somebody that has sex where like unprotected or with people they don't know or just or as a way of sabotaging a relationship so right. like they're in a monogamous relationship and they yeah a lot of infidelity partner. or something yeah. yeah um so those things are all you know seen by society as more common mm -hmm. in, in men and yeah. they're named in women inappropriate intense anger difficulty controlling anger anger mm -hmm. is much more socially acceptable in women I mean, in men, mm -hmm. um, women who are very angry are put more likely to be pathologized. They're seen as hysterical. They're seen as crazy. They're seen as like, wow, yeah. she's like that crazy bitch, you know, if, right. she, if she's, um, has a lot of, of really intense anger. Um, seeing if any, anything else jumps out at me emotional instability and reaction. So I think because women are like men, men are socialized to only show anger mm -hmm. and not show, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the sadness or vulnerability, like fear. Any other emotion. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just kidding. Um, not really. Whereas women do normally. And so, yeah it's seen as women being emotional is seen as um okay sorry i'm having trouble getting my thoughts together so, i was too what is, <laughs> what is what's going today? On? okay so the fact that women are more likely to show a more a wider array of emotion that's what i'm trying to say yeah. it's going to cause them to be more likely diagnosed with borderline yes um and then there was a paragraph in this post that I wanted, in this um, woman's, this mm -hmm. British woman's post I wanted to read. Um, okay. I've been, I've been wondering whether borderline personality disorder is a mental illness slash personality dis disorder at all. 
Considering so many more women are diagnosed with it than men, and considering it's thought to develop in early childhood rather than being an innate mental illness, could there be something about being raised female which increases women's propensity towards borderline type thinking? Could that, quote, inappropriate anger be not a disordered way of thinking, but a valid female rage against a world which devalues women and things which are thought of as, quote, traditionally feminine? Mm. So quick thing I want to point out about that when she says, considering it's thought to develop in early childhood rather than being an innate mental illness, that doesn't really matter because there's a lot of, of real mental illnesses that mm-hmm. are not innate. PTSD, for example, you're mm-hmm. not born with PTSD. You develop it if you experience trauma. Other yeah. than that part, I think there's a lot of truth to this. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that we just devalue women's anger, even though it's usually pretty valid based on the way, you know, our misogynistic patriarchal culture. Um, yeah, definitely. And kind of along with that, like you were saying about, you know, PTSD is the disorder that comes from trauma, but there's a lot more, um, thinking out there now that borderline is a trauma response. You know, if somebody has borderline personality disorder as a diagnosis, then it was really, it's really a trauma response. It develops in early childhood and it's typically, actually, I think always, I don't think, I don't know of anyone who's been diagnosed with it that doesn't have trauma in Mm -hmm. their childhood. Um, So, you know, it, a lot of like very stressful um, situations or being emotionally, physically, or sexually abused, Um, having a neglectful parent, growing up with a family member who has a serious mental health condition or a substance use issue, Mm -hmm. or having a parent that has another personality disorder, um, have all been sort of cited as factors that can cause people to be more likely to develop borderline personality right. disorder. So if you're looking at it as a trauma response of being, you know, trauma informed, then it could be just sort of another manifestation mm-hmm. of part of PTSD yeah. um, or, or an attachment, you know, disorder um, and not so much a, a personality disorder. I don't mm-hmm. know. It's just interesting that. Um, we see those those things come from trauma. And right. then again, women are being sort of blamed um, for their responses to these trauma. It's not mm-hmm. something awful happened to you in childhood and this is how you have adapted and developed because of it. Um, it's, Your very valid response to it, yeah. understandable response to it, and then that response has a label placed on it. Yeah, it. it's and you have a personality disorder. Right. Borderline, yeah. even in the um, mental health professionals, even mm. among mental health professionals, there is so much stigma on borderline. Oh, like, gosh, yeah. If, you, if someone says, oh, I have a client with borderline, it's like, oh, my God, you have a client with borderline. I'm so sorry. That must really suck. Like, People just, even yeah. in the mental health community, like really shame people with borderline. And yeah, and, it's sad. And, okay, fine. Maybe they're difficult clients, but like the way that, that I've heard some of our colleagues talking about it, it, mm-hmm. it really bothers me. I mean, if you don't feel fit to work with them, then fine, refer them to someone else, but don't like, right. about, don't like shame them for it. Yeah, ex- ex- absolutely. Because I mean, yeah, so they might be a difficult client, but like so is lots of other, yeah, you know, diagnoses. Um, and there's something for everyone. If you're, if you're not into treating personality disorders, if you don't enjoy that, then don't, don't take those. Um, I personally am not a fan. I like, I, not a fan. <laughs> I just don't enjoy treating like substance use disorders it's just not my thing that's one of mm-hmm. those things that like people love it or they just don't yeah um i'd rather do you know trauma or or relationship stuff or whatever but 
so I just try not to take, sometimes you have to, but I try my best to not take clients where substance use is the main focus. It's not, if, it, if they have trauma and substance use is sort of has come from that, then that's different. But if it's, you know, if that's the main issue, I, I'm not the therapist for them. And for a lot of people, if you cannot handle personality disorders um, and how they present and the issues that, that come with that, then you just need, to, like you said, refer them out, not take them instead right. of continuing to shame or um, stigmatize them. Because again, <laughs> this population comes from trauma. They've already oh, been through it. Right. They don't need the person that they're coming to for help. And to it is further shame them. Uh-huh. It's a it it's it's tricky though to shaming them, period. Like that doesn't mm -hmm. didn't happen. But it is tricky to because it takes a while to, to to diagnose a personality disorder. And then sometimes it's already when they've developed a relationship with their therapist. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you know, I think I I going to, to diagnose you with person with uh, borderline personality disorder and I'm not trained in working with with personality disorder so I need to refer you to someone else then it's another abandonment then they're that's gonna true they're good gonna point yeah mm -hmm. um but I feel like even I feel like among mental health professionals personality disorders are the only ones I don't know I feel like I don't hear therapists shaming other disorders as much as they do personality disorders and yeah. i it really bothers me i can see yeah we should be doing better as professionals mm -hmm. um absolutely and just the way we talk about it in our vernacular you know don't say oh that person that person has a personality disorder that person is borderline that person is a narcissist which i hear a lot <laughs> I hear narcissists thrown around oh, a lot. Nice. It's yeah. like, just because they're an asshole doesn't mean they're a narcissist. You yeah. know, like, doesn't mean they have a personality disorder. Those are different things. Please stop just making people with personality disorders out uh -huh. to be complete assholes. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, they're difficult and they're pervasive. And, you know, whether or not it's rooted in misogyny, you know, um, which it, it probably certainly is. It, mm. It's still an issue. There's still something going on um, with people that have this diagnosis and they still need treatment and mental health, um, you know, uh, resources and they need support. Yeah. And more than ever, I think probably this population needs people that are solid, that are understanding and can set really good boundaries, but still respect and care about that person in some way. Um, so that they, that, that sense of abandonment is not constantly reinforced. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, one more point I want to make on this real quick. Um, there's a, she says in this post, in an ideal world, women would not be seen as the quote other and our natural behaviors would not be seen as deviant so i think that's a really good point that we see the way that whether it's the way men are naturally or the way that society has decided men are mm -hmm. that is seen as the no like that's seen as the standard that's seen as the norm and anything else is seen as the other or the deviant the you know people mm -hmm. that are being deviant of the norm and then those are the ones that get pathologized and we also have to look at how this affects men because mm -hmm. that puts so many men who may have this disorder who yeah. are not getting treated yeah yeah and then on top of that you have just the stigma of mental illness which is higher for men than women and that's a piece of why a lot of these mental illnesses it is reported that women have them more because because women are more likely to seek help right um but we i mean we we have to open up like give men room to mm -hmm. it, we, we can't we can't see it as men are this way women are this way because it leaves men it, 
it overdiagnoses women and it underdiagnoses men. Yes. Because yeah. there are men, I'm sure there are more, plenty of men that have borderline personality disorder and their behaviors are not pathologized because it's seen as normal for men. And then they're not getting the help they need. And it's, and it's right. Really for them. And they don't have a space to, you know, say, yeah, this is, you know, like when it comes to advocacy or like, um, you know, a lot of people that have mental health um, diagnoses kind of have like their own sort of like group, right? Of like mm -hmm. a support system online or a support group, you know, face to face, which like nobody's doing that anymore. But, um, you know, sort of like I suffer from depression and this is what depression is like for me, you know, and men with borderline can't always just be like either they're not diagnosed or they are diagnosed and the stigma because it's like a woman's um mm -hmm. you know disorder no one can see your air quotes she did an air quotes. <laughs> like, i'm not like trying to like i'm just <laughs> no, doing know. that you know um but you know because it is uh seen as a, mm -hmm. a female sort of thing um, then men, you know, they can't just be like, oh, I have borderline and this is how it affects me. And this is, mm -hmm. you know, they don't, they're not able to talk about it as much. And it can also be stigmatized in that maybe if, you know, the man is very emotional or, you know, um, has a lot of relationships that come and go very quickly because of their, you know, fear of abandonment or, um, you know, has these sort of these mood swings or whatever, then it's typically, you know, um, they're, they're typically sort of shamed for that as being like more feminine um, mm -hmm. or, you know, more like a woman, like, oh, you've got, you know, are you PMSing is like heard, mm -hmm. heard a lot or like, why are you being so emotional? Like just man up or just tough it out or whatever. Um, and so then that isolates men from getting help too. So, I mean, you know, this is the thing about like feminism or how it should, you know, how it should be is if it's a woman's mm -hmm. issue, it is also a man's issue mm -hmm. in some way. It is everyone's issue. Yeah. I, I, when we were just talking about this, um, I couldn't imagine, you know, I mean, I, I think that there's plenty of things about being a woman that I could do without, for sure, <laughs> uh, to say the least. But uh, I couldn't imagine just feeling like my emotional expression is like put in this little box. And it's like you're only allowed to express these certain emotions. And if you express these emotions, then you're seen as weak. And mm -hmm. I mean, of course, like we've said, if women express those emotions, they're seen as crazy. But like, yeah, still, there's still more room for women to express to express emotions than men and it, there and, is it's more forgiven and yeah women. and that's a piece of feminism and and it really needs to you know we, we we do need to talk about how the patriarchy negatively affects men too oh sure. yeah right yeah. and uh okay, one last thing i just thought of this mm -hmm. like i was actually talking to a, a client the other day um and, and pretty much what what the whole thing boils down to was I we kind of we were discussing how like there's lots of groups for women mental health groups support mm -hmm. groups for women um because women go to them but yeah. if you had a support group or a mental health group that was just for men nobody would show up yeah and um this is court ordered yes unless yeah. it's court ordered or it's um with uh, it has religious undertones so like because that's kind of what we were talking about was like religion um can give men that sense of like having a group and being able to like they can go to other men and talk to them about things you know they might have like a bible study or a worship group or something that's just for men about men's issues and that is kind of a way for men to have that connection that women get a lot of times with 
their friends, their, their mm-hmm. group of friends that men don't have socially. Um, and so w- when it's like court ordered or it involves religion, yeah, you'll see, you'll see men there. But if it's like a voluntary, like let's have a support group for yeah. male survivors of trauma, nobody's showing up. And that's really sad. It is. Yeah. That's why, you know, there's the suicide rate among men are so high. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also, um, I know we're trying to, we're trying to wrap up. We're going to wrap up. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but real quick. So I, um, I was wanting to start a group for men, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I was talking to a few people. I'm like, do you think, uh, do you think men would come to a therapy group that's led by a woman? And, and most of them said, like people that, you know, I consulted with about this were like, well, I think men feel more comfortable going to a group that's led mm-hmm. by a man, but most therapists are women, which is also a piece of, of the issue is that like women are socialized to be more nurturing and more empathetic. And yeah. so like, women end up becoming therapists and then they end up starting groups for women right. who, you know, and this is like a, a just a that's- cycle. That's true. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think they're right. I think men would rather go to a group led by a man. But at least in my experience, and I'm, this is not, you know, I have no real evidence behind this except my personal experience. My male clients, I've like really got a niche now with like mm-hmm. male trauma victims. And it's like, I'm getting a lot of that. And um, I like it because it's just a totally different representation of working with women with trauma, but I'm I'm getting a lot of male clients and they're saying like, I am more comfortable talking to you because you Mm -hmm. are a woman. If you were a man, I would not tell you these things. Yeah. And because I'd be afraid that you would judge me. Uh Uh-huh. And I'm like, you're not afraid that I'm going to judge you now, you know, but it's not, I mean, you know, it's like, just the way you said that, you said like, (laughs) what makes you think I'm not judging? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. No, but you know, like, so why do you think you automatically assume because I am a woman that I'm going to be more open minded, mm-hmm. more compassionate, more empathetic? And you automatically assume that a male therapist won't be those things. Yeah. Um, so it's just interesting how that works. One on one, I think uh, men prefer female. I think that this, it is, is, it is the, um, the group setting i think Mm -hmm. you're right that it is that it is different which is weird but yeah yeah all right to wrap up for today that's our show (laughs) if you enjoyed this episode please share with friends and family and don't forget to follow the show's instagram for updates on new episodes at just underscore mental underscore health underscore (laughs) podcast We record a new episode every week. This is Stephanie. This is Emily signing off. Thanks for listening.